Since I made my last video about topology tips in Blender, I've had a bunch of requests to make some sort of follow-up, and I did promise a few months back that this would be a series. So luckily I have quite a lot of these tips up my sleeve, so let's take a look at some of the methods professionals use to handle their topology when 3D modeling. So at the end of my last topology video, I showed off a method to create a cylinder that has all quads and no engons on the cap. A lot of people said they found that really useful and there's actually a few methods of doing this with various strengths and weaknesses. So I thought I would show off a few of the methods that I commonly use. So the first method is essentially the same as the one I demoed in the last video. You just delete the top of a cylinder and then you select the top edge loop. You press E to extrude and S to scale it in a little bit. And then if you press Control F with the inner ring selected, you can perform a grid fill operation. You can straighten this out a little bit if it's wonky by playing with the offset number. And I tend to find that you get slightly better distribution of faces if you enable simple blending. In object mode, if I press Control and a number like four, I'll add a subdivision surface modifier and I can add some support loops and as you can see we get some nice shading and good quad topology. We can also easily change how sharp the edge of the cylinder is just by grabbing these edge loops and double tapping G and then sliding them closer or further away from the edge. The next method requires you to have a cylinder that has a triangle fan. There is an option for that when you make the cylinder or if you've already got the cylinder in the scene you can select the top, inset a little bit press M and collapse, and you'll get a triangle fan. So if we select the top and we inset again, then we just need to go around and manually select every other one of these edges that make up the triangles. Unfortunately, check a deselect and things like that won't work here. So you do have to do it manually, but it doesn't take very long. Once you've got that done, you can press Control and delete, which will dissolve those edges. And now the triangles are actually all quads. So we can add in a support loop to this because if you look, if we add the uh, subdivision surface, you can see it goes a bit wobbly, but if we add support loops in, we get a nice smooth top on the cylinder. So for this final method, we're just gonna need a plain cylinder. I'm gonna go into top view with number pad seven. I'm gonna select the top and bottom most vert and I'm gonna press J to join them. Then we're gonna do that one vertex either side. I'm going to do 11 horizontal cuts. So I'm starting with the middle row, then I'm doing five above, and then I'm going to go down and select the ones underneath, and I'm going to do the five below. If you don't connect the last one together, then what you'll notice is that that face is actually a quad with four sides on the edges. So now, like before, we can just add in our supporting loop. And we can select all of the faces on the top and do an inset with the I key to add a supporting loop around the top as well. And if we add a subdivision surface modifier, we get another nice smooth result. Now, I don't use this one very often, but it can be handy when you need to transition from a cylinder to a square shape, or if you're using the subdivision surface modifier like this, you can make these nice inset shapes, which sometimes comes in handy. Okay, so this mesh has edge loops that go horizontal and it has vertical ones. But what if we wanted to change the direction of a loop so it goes something like this around a corner? Well, that's actually quite easy to do. All we need to do is select the two edges that we want to become our redirection point, press M and collapse. In theory, we have just done exactly what we set out to achieve. We've redirected a loop to go around a corner. You can see that we still have edge loops that go horizontal and we have vertical ones, but we now have an edge loop which turns the corner. However, this looks really bad and it's messy topology. So I'm just gonna use the snapping tools to align this with the other verts around it to move it into a bit of a better position. You can see that we've created two triangles here as well. All I'm gonna do here is just select these two edge loops and press control and delete and just dissolve them entirely. Now we have the really nice clean topology that we were looking for and we still have that redirected edge loop with one going horizontal, one vertical, and one around the corner. If we apply a subdivision surface modifier to this, you can see that we get some pretty decent looking topology and it's a nice smooth curve. The next thing I wanna talk about is dealing with poles. A pole is a vertex connected to multiple edges. There's two types of poles to be concerned about in 3D modeling. 
There's N poles, which have three edges, and E poles, which are connected to five edges. Poles with six or more connecting edges are usually considered bad topology and should just be avoided entirely where possible. E poles, the ones which have five edges, are most commonly created when you extrude a face out, and N poles, the ones with three edges, are most often found on sharp corners. Now, poles aren't necessarily bad, and often they're actually unavoidable. However, you do need to manage them properly to make sure that they don't cause shading issues and other mesh artifacts. Generally speaking, you should avoid placing either type of pole on a curve with a steep gradient. Try to move the pole away to a flatter area of the mesh instead. For example, here is a mesh with an A pole right on the corner, and you can see once we apply the subdivision surface modifier, it causes this weird pinching effect. Now here's the same mesh, only I've moved the pole so that it's further back from the curve and now on a flat surface, which completely eliminates all the problems. Before we move on, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsors of this video, ASUS and Intel. They've sent me this. It's a ASUS Pro Art Studio Book 16 OLED laptop. And this thing is a real beast for creative work. It comes with a powerful Intel Core i9 13980HX processor, an RTX 4070 graphics card, 8 terabytes of storage and 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's powered by a 13th gen Intel Core i9 processor and the 16 inch ASUS Lumina OLED display looks absolutely gorgeous. It's 3.2K resolution, touch compatible and the laptop comes with a stylus in the box which is really handy for 3D work. Another great feature specifically for 3D artists is the inclusion of a dial for precision control when adjusting parameters like colours and brush sizes. The ASUS dial has a lot of useful applications that can be adjusted in the ASUS Pro Art Creator Hub app. This is an application that makes it really easy to calibrate and customise your device, as well as monitoring its performance. I'll be spending the next few weeks putting this laptop through its paces with a really ambitious project, so keep an eye out for that video. You'll find a link in the description where you can find out more about this ASUS laptop and the Intel processor that powers it. Also, you might want to check out the ASUS Pro Artist Awards for 2023. It's currently open for submissions. It's always a fantastic competition and the total prizes this year are worth more than $100,000. Topology of the human face is one of the more daunting exercises in 3D modeling. It's very complex shape to begin with and you need to think about how the mesh will deform when it's animated and you also want to avoid any weird shading artifacts. Over the years, 3D modelers have devised a fairly standardized method of face topology. So one edge loop should go around the eyes, another loop goes around the mouth. A wider loop goes around the chin and across the bridge of the nose, and then there's a fourth loop that usually surrounds the ears. And it's just a case of expanding these loops and joining them together. You'll notice where the loops do join, it creates E poles. This method puts the e-poles in the least problematic areas. They're inevitable, but if you use this loop arrangement, it shouldn't cause any issues. This final tip is a really quick one. When you're making a deformable joint on a character, such as an elbow, a knee, or a finger knuckle, it's important to have a edge loop which runs around the circumference of the top of the joint. You can see that here on this human generator model. It's actually very easy to do. You just need to select the top eight or so faces that surround the top of the joint and press I to inset, and that'll create the edge loop for you. This way you don't get any weird artifacts from stretching and deforming in the mesh. Thanks for watching this video and thanks to ASUS and Intel for sponsoring it. Make sure you check out the link in the description to read more about the ProArt 16 laptop.